We're in a series on Wednesday night talking about the four baptisms of Jesus. The, John's bab, baptized him with water. And then um, there's called the baptism of death. And then uh, Jesus' death is called a baptism. And um, then he will baptize with the Holy Spirit. And then there is he will baptize with fire. And so... We're going to study those four. Uh, we're in the baptism of death, and this is our second study. Uh, this is part two, because last time when I discussed this, I didn't get to my final point, and the final point was really important, so I made a whole lesson out of it for tonight. Um, Galatians 2.20, Paul wrote, as probably you're very familiar with this passage, but he says, I, I have been... Notice how that's written. I have been, not I am. It's, he doesn't say, because people misquote this all the time. People say, I am crucified with Christ. That's not what this says. This says, I have been. And I, I'll show you why that's correct and why I am is not. <laughs> Uh, I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life, with the, the life between you and Christ who lives in you, and the life which I now live, that is the Christ life, in the flesh, that's in our body, I live by faith in the Son of God, that's Christ, I, 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 li I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and delivered himself up for me. So there's two pa 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 parts of this about crucified. He mentions it twice. I'm going to read it again. Notice he, he mentions it first and last. Watch this. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave, maybe your translation, and gave himself up or he delivered. What's it say? <coughs> gave himself. It's all right. But it's actually and delivered himself up for me. See, delivered himself up. We're talking about the crucified. Right? Now, we're going to talk about that tonight. We're going to talk about that passage. The passage is really important because it's dealing with the death of Christ and it's our engagement in it. And a, one of the great lessons that the church doesn't teach anymore, maybe haven't taught this for maybe 50 years, is positional truth. And it, positional truth comes from positional sanctification. Now, people know about sanctification, but they don't know about the positional truth from it. And, uh, and th that's a shame that that doctrine has been thrown under the bus. So we're, we're, we're going we're, we're gonna to show you how this all works in connection with that. We're going to talk about, well, I'm going to break down the idea of sanctification I mean, people have heard that, but they don't understand what that means in the practical way of their life in Christ. And it's really mentioned here. So after a word of prayer, we're going to come in and we're going to take a look at this. Uh, it's a basic doctrine that's been lost. You're never going to hear that. You, you, even, you even don't hear much of the word sanctification anymore. But, but then people quit preaching on sin too. So <laughs> I mean, we got a whole lot of stuff going here. So... Let's, let's have a word of prayer. You know, classroom etiquette says, if you believe that Christ died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead, called the gospel, and you believe that, then you're saved by grace through faith and not of yourself as a gift. And when that happened, you, because we live in the new, under the new covenant of the church age, 
you received eight works of the Holy Spirit. Boom, just like that. And they're part of the 50 things you receive in your salvation package as a gift from God that you can never lose in time and eternity. One of those eight works is sanctification. Another one of those eight works is he indwells you. He took up residence inside your body and your body became the temple of God. I mean, we're talking about something that's mobile in the, under the new covenant, aren't we? I mean, as mobile as you are. So, sanctification is a really important part of the indwelling of Christ and, and that's setting you apart for the holy identity, identify of holiness with God. I mean, just think about it. Is Well, anyhow, I'm about to have prayer. Um, it's a spiritual book for spiritual people, for spiritual living. You can't learn it in carnality and you can't live it in carnality. How do you deal with it? You deal with confession of sin, mental attitude sins, sins of the tongue, overt sins. What do I do with it? First John 1 John 1.9 tells you, he said, if you confess your sin, you can do that because you're a priest in the church age. First Peter 2 says you're a priest. That's a gift from God. It's not you earned it. You don't deserve it. You're a priest. As a priest, you confess your own sins. And First uh, John 1 John 1.9, if we confess our sins, he's, he is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us. Cleansing puts us back into a, a fellowship relationship. We have a relationship with God through his son. This gives us fellowship like in verse 5. So I give you a moment. Examine your life in regard to personal sin. It could be mental attitude sins, you know, like anger, or fear. It could be a lot of things. Sins of the tongue, pretty obvious, overt sins. Father, we're so thankful tonight for these who have come our way both by automobile and by internet. We pray the Holy Spirit would minister the truth of the Word of God tonight about the baptism of Christ and how it affects our life, how it affects our life. The baptism of his death and how we're identified with it. I pray you would teach us that tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we're in a, as I mentioned in my introduction, we're in this series and positional truth is the way you understand, at least in my opinion, one of the, the way to understand sanctification is to break it down and make it sensible. So I'm going to try to do that as best I can in theology uh, to do that for you. Let me give you an example of it. Um, go to 2 Thessalonians in your Bible a moment to the second chapter uh, of 2 Thessalonians in the second chapter. 2 Thessalonians 2.13. 2.13 is an example. 2.13. Paul wrote, But we should always give thanks to God for you, brethren beloved by the Lord. Brethren beloved by the Lord. Because God has chosen you from the beginning for salvation. Watch this now through sanctification by the Spirit, Holy Spirit, and faith in the truth. And notice is that sanctification is connected with your what? Salvation. The hegeospos is the Greek word. And it, it means the setting, the setting of God set you aside at the point of salvation. Sanctification means that God set you aside for holiness. In other words, to live the life that God had originally intended for man to live. Right? The Garden of Eden before Adam fell. Now we have to have a power to do that. We, don't, we can't do it in our own strength, in our own will. It has to be done by the Holy Spirit. You see that? Listen again. We should always give thanks to God for you, brethren, beloved by the Lord, because God has chosen you in Christ. God has chosen you in Christ from the beginning for salvation 
through sanctification by the Holy Spirit and faith in the truth. I mean, where do I get the assurance that God set me aside for holy living? What do I, listen, you know what holy living is for? It's not for from you to others. That's secondary. The primary is between you and God. He's a holy God, can't have anything to do with sinful man. He removes that identity from you the moment you believe the gospel of Christ. He removes that identity through the blood of Christ. He, I, he removes that and gives you, in place of it, in Christ, he gives you sanctification. He gives you, as a gift from salvation, the ability for God to commune with you as your father, your daddy. Is that not magnificent? And it's for you to have a relationship with a holy God. Listen to me now. That is meaningful to you. I meet so many Christians who don't have that meaningful life relationship with God. Holiness is, is not a big issue. And yet it is a key issue, isn't it? And so what he did, because knowing in his salvation when he saved you, what will wash away my sin, but the blood of Christ. When he did that, he put the Holy Spirit in you, which produces holiness so that you, as a redeemed sinful man, still with a sin nature, capable of sinning, mental attitude, sins of tongue, both hurt, gives you the power of the Spirit. You don't have to sin. You don't have to sin, but you do have to walk in the Spirit. If you, Galatians 5, 16 says, if you walk in the Spirit, you will not fulfill the desires of the flesh. What is the fulfilling of the desires of the flesh is sin. And then like in Romans, the 13th chapter, verse 14, it says, listen, the key to the Christian life and holy living is don't make provisions for the lust of the flesh in your life. Don't make, provi don't make provisions for it. All right? How does that happen? Well, you're tempted, but do you have to give in to the temptation? No, but where does the power come in that temptation that is overwhelming? Where does the power come to be able to walk away and have, have a, a, a good feeling about the fact that you were a holy person in that moment? It comes from the power of the Holy Spirit. It doesn't come from your own will. There's no victory in the willpower over sin. Do you understand that? The victory is submitting. Listen, if you're in sin, the, the great victory is understanding that you can confess your sin and the blood of Christ is still working on your behalf because you're still a holy person, right? You're st positionally, you are. He's not going to remove your sanctification and he can't remove the Holy Spirit. The power to live the holy life is not in you. It's in the spirit that is in you, the Holy Spirit that is in you. Right? Well, it's, of course it is. Okay. Now, on your paper, I want you to go, go up to your paper. I'm one, two, three, four. I'm in the fourth paragraph. And I've, I wrote out Galatians 2.20. And it says, I have been crucified with Christ. Now, see the word S-U, the S-U on the front of that Greek word? See the S-U on the front? There's an S-U and then an S-T-A-U-R-O-O. -O. Well, that first S-U is a preposition soon, S-U-N, but they dropped it. They dropped it. Uh, but that's, the, that's, a, that's a preposition, and it means together with. And that's why it says, I have been crucified with Christ. Having been crucified with is this verb. And it's, look, watch this now. <laughs> It's a perfect passive <laughs> indicative. It's a perfect passive indicative. The perfect tense is really unique because in the English, that's where you have have been crucified. Have been crucified is the perfect tense in the English. That's the perfect tense with the passive voice. Been. Have been crucified is a perfect passive and this is an indicative or a reality of Christ dying on the cross. He didn't die there for himself. He died there for you. And so he says, and look, I have been crucified with Christ at some point 
in the past. <laughs> and remain in that position forever. Now he explains what he means by that when, when in later in this passage of, um, uh, of Galatians 2 when he says that Christ loved me and gave himself up for me and delivered himself up for me, right? Or gave himself up for me. That's what he's talking about. And, and the reality is, the perfect tense is that in eternity past, God set up the program of the crucifixion of Christ. God chose Christ to be the one that would offer salvation through the self -sacrifice, through his sacrifice of himself, right? In our place. This is called substitutional, in our place. For us, substituted. That's that hooper business in the Greek. So this is how this has worked out for us. So when I, when the gospel is presented to me and I believe the gospel for my salvation, listen to me, I now understand that I was identified in eternity past in the program where God chose Christ. When I choose Christ, I'm chosen of God. That's the doctrine of election. And now I am part of something that started before the world began, before the foundation of the world. I am now actively engaged in something that God designed in eternity past. I'm now presently engaged in that in real time. I was crucified with Christ. It was decreed by God that every person believe, that believes in the Lord Jesus Christ is identified with the crucifixion of Christ once identified, listen to me now, once identified by faith in the gospel, once I'm identified with the crucifixion of Christ, I am identified with that forever. That's positional truth. You know, people say you can lose it. The only way you can lose it is there be no God. If there is no God, then you've lost it. Because it's his program. It's not yours. It's not mine. It's not, the, it's not even the church's. It's his. I have been crucified with Christ. I have been crucified with Christ, he says. And it is no longer I who live. But Christ lives in me. See, that's the, that's the reality of being saved. I mean, how, how do you measure yourself? You say, well, Ron, I've been saved. Well, what is the, when you look in the mirror and you say, I'm saved, and, and then your conscience says, take a better look at that, and you go like, yeah, but I haven't lived for Christ, and I haven't done this, and I haven't done that. The answer is, why not? Because he says, it is no longer I who live. See, that's the problem, ain't it? And that's your problem in your life. I mean, who's living your life? Well, I can tell you the choices you're making. What kind of choices are you making? If you're making all the choices in your life without Christ, then, then this isn't part of your life, but Christ lives in me. Christ living in you, identified with the crucifixion, still identified with the crucifixion of my Christian life. That's the, that's the key behind 1 John 1, 9. The cleansing still works for my life. I confess my sin. He's faithful and just to forgive me. I'm talking about a Christian. Listen, you know, they used to say where the, when, when the rubber hits the pavement. I, I don't play, I don't play, say that anymore. Yeah, they do. <laughs> listen, it, listen, here it is. It's no, I mean, it's no longer, I, no longer I who live. You say, is it, what do you mean it's no longer you who live? It's Christ who lives in me. I mean, is that a, one, is that a, a Sunday deal, you know, where you put on your best and come to church and act phony baloney? Is that what we're talking about? Huh? Well, I go to church. Big deal. Does Christ, do, do, is, does Christ dominate your life? 
You get up in the morning thinking about Christ, go to bed all day long thinking about Christ, go to bed at night thinking about Christ. No, I only do it when I go to church and sing a hymn. That's not what I'm talking about. People on the Internet, I am not talking about that. I'm talking about a life-changing experience where I've identified myself with Christ because I believe the gospel of Jesus Christ and it is no longer I who live. I mean, that's the gauge of this. It's no longer I. I don't call my shots anymore. That's a sign of maturity. It's a sign of maturity. It doesn't mean you're not saved. It just means you're not mature. Say, so, well, I got saved when I was eight. I can remember out of the old church, and I can remember the plank. I remember the pew. I remember the sermon. That's wonderful. What's happened between eight and now? I mean, you when they talk, I hear, I was with a person the other day just gave, gave a glowing testimony of their conversion. And it was like 40 years ago. And the last 40 years, they've been in a wilderness of wandering, gr groping for God. How is it, you know, some point you got to quit that. You know what? You know what that 40 years in the wilderness is without God? It's, you know what God's trying to tell you? It's no longer you because 40 years has been all about you. The last 40 years has been all about you. And how's that gone? Well, I've been through two divorces. This guy said, I've been through two divorces. My kids won't have anything to do with me. <laughs> well, how's the wilderness? You, you've spent 40 years on yourself. How's that worked out? Not very good. Maybe it's time to figure out a change then. Here's the change. I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. How about that change? That's been there since dirt. That's how old this idea is. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. <clears throat> every member, point number one, every member of the human race is in one of two circles according to 1 Corinthians 15, 21, 22. I just put two circles. Put two circles on your paper. There's a gap. See that gap in point one? There's a gap on your paper. <clears throat> what, you draw two circles on, on your paper. Draw two circles on your paper. Somebody's got a pencil if you need one. <clears throat> in this first one, I want you to put the word in Adam. Many of you are familiar with this. And on the other circle, put in Christ. Because that's what that says, doesn't it? Let me turn over there to you. 1 Corinthians 15. I'm going to do 21, then 22. For since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. What's he talking about? Well, he's talking about Adam and Christ. See, when he talks about the first man in verse 21, for since by man came death, death, by man came the resurrection or life. We're talking about eternal life. Eternal life. Look at verse 22. For in Adam, oh, the first man was Adam. And the last man in 1 Corinthians 45, 15, 45, is Christ. First Adam, last Adam. Here's what he says. For in Adam all die, boom. That, he's talking spiritually now. He's talking spiritual. These are spiritual. He's talking spiritual. For in Adam all die, in Christ all will be made alive. He's talking about spiritual life. Spiritual death. Spiritual death. And spiritual life. Okay? Every member of the human race is born in Adam. How do I know that? I know that from Romans 5.12. Wherefore, by one man Adam, sin entered the world, and death by sin, and so death spread to all mankind. I'm talking about physical death. That's, that's the secondary part of this. The secondary part of this is physical death. The primary part of it is spiritual death. You can, be you can be physically alive and spiritually dead. In fact, that's the way you were born. And if you die that way, having rejected the gospel between birth and death, you will go to hell. You will actually, to be technical, you will go to the lake of fire. Revelation 20. Now, 
in Adam we all die, in Christ we're all made alive. This is every member of the human race. This is first birth. That's first birth. Everybody's physically born. You're physically born alive, spiritually dead. Why? Because of Adam's sin of Genesis 2.17. What does that say? Don't eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. One commandment. He gave them one commandment in the Garden of Eden. One commandment. And you know who was after that one commandment from their life? The devil. As soon as you learn the word of God and the truth of the word of God, guess who's there to steal it? You know, in the parable of the sower, he told you that. In the parable of the sower, the four grounds, he told you. You know who's there to steal the word out of your life? The devil. <laughs> Genesis 2, 7. Don't eat of three of knowledge. So what did they do? They eat of three of the knowledge. And that's how we got spiritual death. And that's why you're born in spiritual death, not a choice. It's a position. See that word in? Listen to that. For in Adam, for in Adam, for in Adam all die. For in Christ all are made alive. In, that's positional. In the Greek language, this is N plus the locative. This is the locative of sphere. Both of these are. N plus the locative of sphere, that's why there's two circles drawn. Okay? Now, those who have been in basic Greek with us, you know that. You've gone through the Greek class. You know what I'm telling you. You can look this up in your lexicon. I mean, you know this. This is not brain surgery. This is, so you're in a sphere here. The question is, how do I get out of here and get over here? How do I do that? Well, there's all kinds of joint churches, get religious, believe in God. No, that's not how you get from there to there. That's not how you do it. No, this is how you do it. 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4. Christ died for your sins. Christ died for your sin. You've got to go to the cross. We call that the gospel. Christ dies for your sin, is buried and raised from the dead third day. Paul calls that the gospel in 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4. When you believe that to be the source of your salvation, according to Romans 1, 16, then the gospel, death, burial, resurrection, the gospel is the power of God to save everyone who believes. I mean everyone. I don't care. Listen, it don't matter how bad you've been in life because you're in Adam. The only way to get out of Adam is through the gospel of Christ. You must believe it to get over here. I don't care. It doesn't, it, I don't care what you're doing out here. You say, well, Ron, I've really, I've really, really lived a tough life. I mean, I've been, I've been, boy, I just, oh, Ron, I, I would hate to tell you all the stuff I've been involved in. Well, let me tell you why you probably, let me tell you that right there. This is what you got to worry about. Because it is in Adam that you're what? Spiritually dead. All of this activity in your life is a result of a, of a dead man's work. There are 13 judicial charges connected to Adam's sin in your life. And you don't have the power to get out of it. You couldn't go to enough churches. You couldn't join enough to get out of that. So God sent his son, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever would believe in him would not perish, that's part of this, but have eternal life. This is part of this. Now, I want you to go to Colossians 1, 13. I'm going to show you how this works. Now, listen, you're missing this. Before you let, Turn over there because I told you turn, so you're just good students. So let's turn over there, and I want to come back to my point. Here's my point. Now, watch this. This is that N plus the locative means a position, a position of identity. 
in, in, right? That's a position. I'm in the car. I'm in the house, right? It's, it's, where, it's a place. It's where you are. I, I am. It's a position. In Adam's a position. In Christ is a position. Do you understand that? They're both positions. Okay. All right. So they're both positions. All right. In Colossians 1.13, for he delivered us or rescued us, delivered or rescued. He delivered or rescued. Watch this in, Col in Colossians 1.13. He delivered us or rescued us from the domain of darkness, that's in Adam's sin, and transferred and transferred, here's the transfer, here's the rescue, Christ dies, when you believe, he rescues you from Adam, he delivers you from here, through the cross, to here, John 14, 16, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, agreed? No man can come to the Father except through me. See, salvation is going from Adam to Christ, and from Christ to God, you understand that? If, you, if you're an Adam, you might believe there's a God, but you're not in a relationship with him because you haven't been sanctified. You're not in that relationship. You're in this. And listen, the only way to get to God is to go to Christ. And to get there, you've got to go through the gospel. I am the way, the truth, and life. No man can come to the Father except through me. And when you go through the gospel to get to Christ, then you have God. He becomes your daddy. And he, how long is he? Forever. <laughs> That's the perfect tense. Forever. I mean forever. Now, let me show you here. Let me show you something. John 5, go to John 5, 24 a moment. Let me show you something. This is another way of saying the same thing. And this one's really interesting because it's John 5. It's verse 24. And it's truly, truly, I say to you, for those of you that are going to church here on Sunday, you know, we've been in a long series on truly, truly, I say to you, which are messianic, important messianic doctrines be carried out of the Jewish age into the church age. Carried out of the Jewish age by his disciples into the church age. Are you with me? That's very important. And, and, all right. Now listen to what he says. I'm in, one of those, I'm in one of these very important doctrines for you and I. Right? Because you and I live under the new covenant of the church age. Listen to what he says. Truly, truly, I say to you. Now, this is Jesus speaking in the Jewish age to a group of people that he wants to take this message to the church, to the new covenant. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. Watch this now. Does not come into judgment. But has passed out of death into life. Has passed over. Isn't that something? And when you do, you get eternal life. This is removed because if you die there, you're going to go into judgment. That judgment is going to carry you all the way to Revelation 20. The great white throne judgment. But if you believe the gospel of Christ, you pass over that whole business. This whole business here is now all gone. Every bit of that is gone. Gone. Because God decreed that this is the way it works. I'm going to send my son to do all the work for salvation. When you believe it, you cross over. And that work is done in your life. That's a, that's a magnificent idea, people. Passed. Oh, we, have, we are passed out of death and into life. You know how they got it? Ephesians 2, 8, 9. 
For by grace you are saved through faith and not of yourself. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest you boast. The Christian life is not about your boast. The Christian life is about the, about the boast that Christ lives in me. It's no longer I who live, but it is Christ in me who lives. And that life that I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. Hoo-ah. I mean, is that your life? Is it all about me, 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 my way, highway, my way, highway? Is that how you live in your Christian life? Come on. Come on. You know what it tells me? It tells me that Christ is not alive and actively engaged in you, in your opinion. You've shut him down. Is he still there? Yeah, he's not going anywhere. Not going anywhere. Just because you're stupid don't mean he is. Not going anywhere. He's been decreed. Christ in me. The life I live is Christ in me. I'm not religion. It's not religion in me. It's Christ. It's the person of Christ in me. The son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. Now he's in me. Through the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Now. You with me on this? No, I don't know, right? What we've done is move positions. We've went from a position in Adam to a position in Christ by the grace of God through, through the crucifixion. I, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live. It is Christ who lives in me in the life I now, right? Okay, just, I tell you, at some point in your life, you got to bite the bullet. You got to buy into this. And get out of that life that sucks for Christ. You need to get into this life. You live in that. For me, no longer I. You, that's where you got it. You got to pass over. All right. Here, here's the here's second point. There are three facets to positional truth. There are three facets. And remember, this is under sanctification. So what we're talking about is sanctification. We're talking about the practicality. We're talking about, the, we're talking about it as truth, positional truth. And he says there are three facets. We call it retroactive positional truth. And, and listen, and the old church just teaches stuff, believe it or not. They have been for about 50 years, except a few of us. The current positional truth and experiential positional truth. If you want to know what all this sanctification business is about, you're going to have to understand these three aspects of positional truth. Did we see that we move from a position in Adam to a position in Christ? Well, these three, under sanctification, I was going to tell you what that means. These are three things. This is going to explain that. It's also going to help you explain. Go back up there where I wrote out Galatians on your paper. See where I wrote out? I've been crucified with Christ. I put R-A-P-T. See that? That right there. Retroactive positional truth. Notice I explained to you retroactive. The dictionary defines your, you can go home and look this up, but the dictionary definition of retroactive is extending in cope or effect to a prior time or condition that existed or originated in the past. That's why we use that word in theology. That's exactly what it means. For example, every person is born in Adam in that position. That's retroactive positional truth. They're born there. You know why? Because of what Adam did in Genesis 2.17. Actually, what he violated was in the third chapter, but what he broke was is, is, Gen is Genesis 2.17. You understand that? Okay. Now, retroactive positional truth identifies every member of the human race with the death of Jesus for the sins of the world, his burial, his resurrection, and when he believes the gospel, he's saved. And therefore, I, I have been crucified with Christ, but it's no longer I who live, it's Christ lives in me. Why are you not living in that power that's been perfected in your life? You have a perfected power, the Holy Spirit. 
I mean, the Christian life has to be lived in the power of the Holy Spirit, people. And how do I know it? it how you're dealing with your life in everyday stuff. Is it I no longer who lives, but Christ lives in me? That's the deal. That's how you, that's how you gauge your life. Retroactive positional truth. Look back up there. It's no longer I who live, live, but Christ lives in me. The, the reality of that is experiential positional truth. That, that's the reality. And the life, which I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God, and the life is current positional truth. See, when he says retroactive, it takes you back to the cross. When he says experiential, that's Christ living in me. That's the experience of Christ. It, that's the experience, experiential positional truth. That's Christ living in me by the power of the Holy Spirit and by the word of God working actively by faith in my life, right? I'm not making this stuff up. Listen, I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. That's, that's experiential positional truth. That's how it, you're experiencing this position in Christ. And the life which I now live, the life is... The current position of truth, it's the life that was brought to you in your salvation. There's, th this is the 50 things you received at salvation you can never lose in time and eternity. Uh, somewhere we got little pamphlets that will show you those 50 things. We're getting ready for Christmas. So I don't know where they are now, but current positional truth on your paper identifies every church age believer with the ascension session of Jesus Christ. For example, 2 Corinthians, here, here's this. Here's 2 Corinthians 5.17. says, 2 Corinthians 5.17. Uh, start me off on that verse. You got, just help me get started with it. That's a, a, a new creation. Well, give me more therefore. <laughs> if, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things become new. So, see that that read, read it read it for us again. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, it, see, you got to be in Christ now. How do I get in Christ? Uh, gospel, right? Transfers with Colossians one thirteen, yeah. right? Go back to in Christ. All right. He is a new creature. He's a new creation. You know what that new creation? Here's another here's another way of looking at that. That's regeneration. That's being born again. That's one of the eight works of the Holy Spirit that every person gets the moment he believes the gospel of Jesus Christ. Do you know those eight works? Well, I'll give you a pamphlet, and then you go home and read it. But I probably got one of my briefcase. I carry them around. But current positional truth. Current positional truth. Then experiential position truth, every church age believer is identified with the ministry of the indwelling Holy Spirit. And I gave you passages on that. <clears throat> and listen, <clears throat> and, and there's one if somebody needs one when you leave. <clears throat> um, experiential position of truth is the Holy Spirit dwells inside your body, dwells inside your body, and your bodies become the temple of God. And now he's there. What's he there for? He got no place else to go? I mean, what's he there for? Well, he's there for the dynamics of the ministry of the church age. It, he never dwelt there. This is the only time in human history up to this point where the Holy Spirit is indwelled. Every believer in, in the Old Testament is only certain believers. And never indwelled them, dwelt among them, dwelt with them went alongside them, so to speak. I mean, we're the most privileged group of people in the whole wide world. We have the Holy Spirit in us that controls the flesh and does the ministry of God in the church age. And we don't even know, we don't know, well, there is a Holy Spirit, but I don't know anything about him. What are you talking about? It is the dynamic. That's like owning a car and not having an engine. That's like having a car and not having an engine. You keep talking about this wonderful car got, got no mileage on it. <laughs> I got a car like that. It's not an engine that's down. It's a battery. You know, a little dinky battery. So there sets that car. No mileage on that. Man, this is a low, low mileage car because my battery's gone. 
you know, I got to jump it off and do something or take it out and take it to the, jeez. Uh, a battery, stupid battery. You spend all that money on a car, right? How much you want for that car? $40,000. I'll take it. Now you got a $30 battery. I know, I feel better, thank you. I want to show you something. I want you, I want you to, I, again, we're still talking about positional. Positional truth is a big thing. When I talk about positional truth, all I'm trying to do is, is bring sanctification into the experience of your life. That's all I'm trying to do. Now, I want, to, I want you to go to Ephesians. Man. I want you, want you to see something. Now, I, I'm going to point it out in English, and I'm going to tell you what it says in the Greek for you. Now, you, I think you'll be able to see it in the English. I'm in the second chapter of Ephesians. And this great passage that Paul gets into about salvation, Ephesians 2, from verses 5 through 10, I'm going to carry it a little further. I'm going to carry it, I think, maybe out to verse 13 because I want, to, I want you to see something. Now, when we go through reading this, now where did I say we we're going to start? I'm going to start in verse 5, but I'm going to, I really want you to pay attention. Did I write these verses 6, 7, 10, and 13? Is that, is that the number? All right, and here's what I want you to watch for. Watch for the words, watch for the words, in Christ. Now, I, I think what they're going to do here, if I remember right, they're going to say, that's position truth. Remember, in plus the, in plus the locative is sphere or position. Uh, and it's going to say, in Jesus Christ. And every time he does that, that's positional truth. Every time. Uh, listen, that, let me show you how powerful this idea is, the sanctification and this idea this little idea of in Christ is used 164 times in the New Testament. <laughs> That's a whole lot of teaching on a subject. All right, so I want to show you one of the, and Ephesians is one of those great books on this subject. So here we are in Ephesians 2, uh, and when we were dead in our trespasses, you know, that's Adam's sin, made us alive together with Christ. That's through, you know, being delivered from one position into another. By grace, you've been saved. Now watch verse 6. And he raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places. Watch this, in Christ Jesus. Look what you have in your position in Christ. You don't earn it. You don't deserve it. But, buddy, you got it. Watch that. He raised us up with him, not just crucified with him, but raised up with him and seated with him in the heavenly places. We know that to be the third heaven in Christ Jesus. That's positional truth. That's, that is the identity of the work of the work under the decree of sanctification. That's per, I mean, that's verse 6. All right, that's verse 6. Verse 6 is powerful, isn't it? Look at verse 7. In order that in the ages to come, he might show the surpassing riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. In Christ Jesus. Because of our position in Christ, we have this. He has us. He is showing us the surpassing riches of his grace in his kindness. You know why? Be not because we're good little kids. Not because we're this or we're that. Not because I can stick my chest out. Because, listen, because of grace, of my position in Christ, I have to this to my advantage. Whew. Verse 8. For by grace you've been saved through faith and not of yourself. It is a gift of God, not of works like any man should boast. Verse 10. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus. The workmanship, we are, God, we are God's workmanship. You know, like a star or a moon or a galaxy. Like a beautiful flower. We are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand, eternal life conference, that we should walk in them. I mean, you have this position in Christ. Walk it. Walk it out in your life. Walk it out, man. 
walk it out. That's why are you still here, Johnny? Why are you still here? Okay. Why am I still here? What's the deal? I've got this position in heaven with him, right? I'm, I'm already locked into the heavenly places. What's, why am I still here? Walk it out, man. Walk it out. What is this? It is Christ alive, living, dynamic in my life. Walk it out. This is why your feet are still here. This is why you're mobile. Oh, at verse 10. Uh, we, uh, we did. Look at verse 13. For now in Christ Jesus, you who formerly were far off, that's Adam, have been brought near by the blood of Christ. He himself is our peace. And then he goes on to discuss things. Here's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to tease you into studying Paul's writings. And every time he tells you that you're in Christ, pay attention because if you believe the gospel of Christ, you are in Christ and these are things that you have. They're given to you. That's part of that. Salvation is a gift. And I mean, if you just went through, if you just took a book like Ephesians and just look for the, every time it said in Christ Jesus or in Christ or in Jesus, pay attention to it and see what all is given to you. I mean, you got so many packages that you haven't opened that go back 40 years in your life. If you walked into a person's house and he still had his Christmas tree up and had 40, 40 gifts under it, and you say, how long? You didn't open your gift. No, I know that I, somebody gave, well, where, when did you get that gift? Well, I got that 10 years ago. What about that one? 20 years ago. What about that one? 40 years ago. I got that one. I can't even remember how far back. Wouldn't that be miserable? I mean, the first thing I want to do, if I get a gift, open it up, aren't you? I mean, I couldn't hardly wait as a kid, could you? I'd sneak out and kind of rattle them and all that kind of stuff. Huh? Rhonda and Deanna. I didn't know this till they were grown. They'd wait till everybody had to sleep. I'm talking about way ahead of Christmas, you know, on Christmas Eve, you know. That way ahead of Christmas, th those two little girls would slip out. They would go out there. They would find their packages. They would, they would look how they were wrapped. They would open up, look at them, then wrap them all back up just like they were. <laughs> I never knew that. <laughs> Can you believe that? Yeah. Sure. Yeah, and they and listen, especially Rhonda, little actress that she is, she would act so surprised that she got, she would act so surprised. Oh, I can't believe it. It's no wonder I'm nuts. It's no wonder, huh? Well, they were adult people. We were sitting around about how to do. Yeah, and they went like, you know, we're talking about how you keep kids from doing this kind of stuff and how you have to hide it and how they find it and they rattle and all that. And I said, boy, we didn't allow any of that stuff, boy. And I said, put my foot down, you know. I played Big Bad Dad. And they went like, they both looked at each other. And I said, what's the deal? And they tell me all this. Well, let me do one more and then I got I to go home. Position of truth is, is, let me close with where I started. Position of truth is part of the theology of sanctification. We looked at 2 Thessalonians 2.13. It'd be well worth your time to look at 1 Corinthians 6.11 and 1 Peter 1 and 2. But here's one in 1 Corinthians 1.2. 1 Corinthians 1.2. To the church of God, which is a Corinth, to those who have been sanctified, to those who have been sanctified, that set apart, by the ministry of the Holy Spirit. That's it. not just that, but eight, the whole eight work package in Christ Jesus. Look there, in Christ Jesus. You know, you know where your sanctification came from? It's a gift from God. That's, you know, now the deal is walk it out. That's experiential positional truth. Walk it out. Walk it out. And you know the word saint? Look at the word saint. See the word, look at the word sanctified in the Greek, H-A-G-I-A-Z-O, see that? Look at the word saint. Same word. It's the same word. The difference is one's a verb, one's a noun. See, saints, 
You know why? You know why we're called saints? Because we've been sanctified. Positional sanctification. We're a saint. You, what, over in Adam, you were a sinner. When you passed over, you were a saint. You, and listen, you're always a saint. I know. Kind of tough to take, ain't it? Saint. Saint, by calling with all who in every place call in the name of the Lord, their God and ours. In the same chapter, 1 Corinthians 1, verse 30. But by his doing, you are in Christ Jesus. See there? Who became to us wisdom from God. Righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. Look at that. And that's something. That's part of it. You know how I got these? You know how I got these? In Christ Jesus. Right? I didn't earn them. I don't earn them. I don't lose them. Because I don't, I don't stay faithful with my hand. Doing, you know. No. No, no. I got this. I got this by grace. I got it by grace. You get it by works. Don't lose it by not working. Didn't get it by working. Don't lose it by God. Listen, this is a gift of God. But listen, this gift is to be exercised. Experience your position of truth. I've got these things. I need to experience them. I have the Holy Spirit. He is the power of sanctification. I need to have that power work sanctification out of my life. Work it out. All right. Some of the other here, just good for you to read. Uh, it'd be well worth your time. In my opinion, it was well worth mine, I can tell you. But I ran out of time tonight. Uh, did she? Well, there you go. Well, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hey, is that dad talking about? You? Oh, my goodness. Yeah. I hope the girls are not listening, right? Let's have prayer. Our Father, we're thankful tonight for your grace and mercy and love, and we, we especially thank you for sanctification as we looked at today positional truth, uh, retroactive positional truth. We've looked at current positional truth, experiential positional truth, because we want to see the dynamics of what does sanctification, how does this thing work in our life in time and eternity, and we get kind of a look at it, and uh, I pray that we would uh, research this, especially this little phrase now, that we might be alert when we read it, used 164 times to reveal some wonderful aspects of the gift of salvation. For we've made our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.